Worcestershire platform. Um, I, I can't wait for you to see them. And then later on in the year, there's the Time Travel Trail. The museum exhibition that's being led by David Nash is due to all being well with the uh, coronavirus roadmap go live at the end of June. And then there's a memories book that Sheena is working on. So just in, in terms of a, uh, an overview, we've just done the welcome. So welcome everybody. We, uh, I believe we've got Joe here. So Joe is going to give a, a brief speech um, uh, about the project. And, and I was reflecting on yesterday really when Sheena and I had the opportunity to, to meet to talk about the project. And I think one of the amazing things about about the Life Stories was the Life Stories project. Is whoever you meet has um, has a story to tell um, and a way of connecting. And, and there'll be something about when you hear Jo speak, not only in terms of what she thinks about the project, but her own experiences. I think that will really resonate. We then move on to Sheena. We'll talk a little bit about how Know Your Place came to be for Worcester um, and their journey. Pete Insol, who is the uh, original developer of of Know Your Place will then talk through the Know Your Place Worcester platform and where it is right now and also demonstrate a little bit of Know Your Place Bristol and, 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 and really recognise just what the platform will come over, over time, which is quite incredible, really. You then have to listen to me for a little bit in terms of just talking about the life stories journey. Um, unfortunately, Polly Kaiser couldn't join with us today. Um, Polly was the founder of the Life Story Network and, and is a friend of mine, and she, she speaks to why life stories are important, maybe some of the things that we need to consider um, and when not to use it. What we did was yesterday at our launch, we've had two launches so that we could hope to, to capture as many people as possible. That's been recorded and we'll show that later. And then finally, I know Sue and Chris are on the, um, on the call, and they will be talking through um, three different ways that the Life Stories platform can be used. At the end of that, there'll just be an opportunity for questions. So you may have a question about Know Your Place Worcester, Life Stories, anything you want to ask, there'll be a bit of time after that to be able to talk about it. So, Jo, are you there? Unfortunately, I think we've lost Jo. Um... Yeah, I can't, I can't see her in our in our list, so I think we may have lost her. So, so Joe, if you do come on, we've just recognised you um, and and the speech that you gave yesterday, and thank you very much for that. And um, you're you're there at least in image. What I'll do now then is hand over to to Sheena. Thanks, Tash. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, it's. A shame not to not to hear from from Joe today. So I think there's probably some technical difficulty there. But if you did want to uh, listen to her speech, uh, it was a really uh, valuable sort of springboard into why we're doing this um, that that she uh, spoke about yesterday. Uh, and that that's actually there on our YouTube uh, video and on on Facebook as well. So um, do have a look at that if you if you want to to pick that up later. Uh, so I'm going to talk about our journey towards uh, launching our fantastic new um, web platform, Know Your Place Worcester. Uh, so just taking it back to the beginning, really. Uh, next slide, Tash. Uh, so this is uh, a screenshot of the Worcester City Historic Environment Record. And this is really the starting uh, place for me um, in terms of, of uh, my day job. So I manage the Historic Environment Record. Um, and this screenshot just shows uh, the the sort of um, the wealth of material that we have for um, the the archaeological resource in Worcester. Um, that's a map of the city centre. You'll see the uh, the River Severn uh, passing diagonally through there, uh, and each one of those points and polygons on that map represents a piece of information. So if you clicked on one of those, that would take you through uh, to the HER. Um, and, and all of the, um, the, the backup material that's in there uh, that informs my day job. So that, that's our starting point. Uh, next slide, Tash. And the next one as well. Um, so, 
Yeah, so so that material is anything from a chance find of uh, on the left hand side there, uh, a Neolithic flint uh, that someone uh, picked up in a uh, when when they were digging over their allotment, um, all the way through to um, a 20th century standing building. And so on the right there, you've got uh, the um, the flats in St John's when they were uh, in the course of construction in the early 1960s. And everything in between, so anything from uh, an archaeological excavation through to a building record uh, and, and all of those um, monuments and buildings that we have in our historic city. Next slide. So that's all backed up by a whole range of um, important sort of uh, materials and a library of information. Uh, we've got library books, archaeological reports. Historic maps. So, for instance, this one is the uh, the uh, first edition ordnance survey from 1885, uh, drawn at one to 500, and that's a really beautiful uh, detailed map that we draw on on a daily basis um, in, in the historic environment record. Um, but it's those sorts of things that we really want to translate into something that local people can access. Next slide. Uh, so, alongside all that material, we've all so got those amazing historic photographs. Uh, so th this is a collection that we have um, we've acquired in the last few years for the historic environment record. Uh, it's a collection of images that have been taken by um, city council officers over the years, uh, mostly planners and conservation officers. And this collection of material had been used on a daily basis by our conservation team to really inform the advice that they give on historic buildings around the city uh, and understanding that streetscape. So this one, for instance, is from 1951, um, showing horse and cart on the shambles. And I always really enjoy this image with the, the children in the front there sort of petting the horse. It's a really evocative image. Um, so again, you know, there, there's that amazing resource that we want to make available to local people. Uh, and alongside that, there are, there are a number of other collections as well, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Uh, next slide. So how do you do that? How do you make that amazing sort of plethora of information more widely ava available to local people? Uh, as I sort of touched on there, a lot of that material is currently um, used in uh, the, the planning uh, service in development management. So um, the historic environment record sort of became a tool for, for planning in the city. But alongside that, uh, it has various other functions. So we use it for um, educational purposes. It's used uh, by researchers. Uh, and and um, accessed by the general public, perhaps people researching their own family histories and so on. Um, but how do you do that? So we we've had a number of uh, events over the years and and making material available via public events. But you can't do that every day. And certainly in the last year, we haven't been able to do it at all. Um, it's been completely impossible. But this this is a lovely image from um, right at the beginning of the Worcester Live Stories journey where we um, held an event at the Guild Hall um, and we set up the high street along the lower hall um, so that you could sort of walk along the street and see those, those images as a sort of time trail, a time travel sort of trail. Um, and it was really, you know, really well attended. We had more than 1500 people came along on the day. Um, but we can't do that every day. And as I said, certainly not at the moment. And how do you make all that material more widely available for people so that they can just dip, dip into it when they want to? Oh, next. I tried to press the button forward. Next slide, touch thanks. <laughs> um, so step forward, Bristol City Council. Um, we've we've had our, our eye on the amazing um, Know Your Place Bristol resource for a number of years. Um, and this was developed by uh, Pete Insol. It was his sort of um creation um and supported by the amazing um geographical information services team um at at bristol um and paul horton um has been the the lead on developing that so i'm not going to talk too much about um know your place bristol and and, and know your place more generally because pete is actually going to come in and do um a, a demonstration of how that works um when i when i've shut up 
Uh, but this, this is a sort of little sneak preview of what that looks like. Next slide. So that was our start, starting point, really. We knew that we wanted to um, develop this resource into uh, a public online platform. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, we, we wanted to engage with the public and make people aware of, of this amazing collection of material uh, and really bring everyone along with us. Uh, so we uh, applied for um, National Lottery Heritage Funding, as Tash mentioned earlier, uh, and that's been supporting the, um, the public engagement work that we've been doing. Uh, so just a couple of examples of how we've gone about that. On the left hand side, we have uh, one of our uh, Worcester News articles, so they've been really supportive of the project. Uh, Barry Kinghorn has um, run these features for us every week. Um, and we've had lots of uh, amazing feedback from local people sharing their memories in response to those. And it's really just continued to, to feed uh, into um, the, the knowledge that, that's growing. And then on the right hand side there um, is one of our Facebook posts uh, about the Worcester Live Stories quizzes. Um, and some of you may have taken part in those over the last year. We've been running them since the, the beginning of the, the, the first lockdown. And now we've had uh, well over 100,000 entries to, to that quiz, which is just incredible. But more importantly than, than putting that information out there is, is all of the conversations that have gone on around it and those memories that they've triggered and the stories that people have been sharing along the way as, as a result of that. Next slide. Uh, so, in addition to all of that material um, that we've already got, we, we also recognised that we wanted to acquire some, some more material to support the, uh, the development of, of Know Your Place Worcester. So, in the background there, you can see we've got our first edition ordnance survey map that I, I showed you previously. Uh, but we've actually been in touch with the National Library of Scotland, would you believe, uh, who have uh, an amazing online mapping resource. Um, that covers the whole country. So we've actually acquired some of the mapping tiles um, from that collection that will eventually be uh, available via Know Your Place Worcester. And so that mapping tile in the, the foreground there is, again, the, the first edition uh, Ordnance Survey, but drawn at one to two five hundred. So that actually covers the wider city area and is it nicely colorized as well. So. Um, those of you that may have that local knowledge will recognise that that's Purdiswell Hall uh, in the middle of Purdiswell Park there. Uh, so that's one of those mapping resources that will, um, over the course of the next few months, become available on the new platform. Next slide. Uh, so in order to make all of those photographs available, we've had a huge amount of support from uh, a team of, uh, well, a veritable army of vo volunteers um, who um, originated um, as the Changing Face of Worcester project, um, still working on that project, but are now supporting us on Worcester Life Stories as well. And a number of other uh, volunteers have joined that team along the way. Um, and they're based out of Tudor House Museum. Uh, this is a, a part of the team here, uh, appropriately socially distanced and all masked up at a point where they were able to meet in person. Uh, but they've been very stoic uh, over the last uh, few months and actually uh, met via Zoom where they couldn't meet in person. So it's been amazing to be able to, to see that team um, working through those images. And, and what they've actually done is they've uh, been producing um, full descriptions of those those images. So whereas um, originally the, the images were just searchable via street name, we can now actually search those thematically. Uh, so if you were, were someone that was wanting to, to look at a particular building or a, um, a your first car, for instance, all of that is there within the description um, of that image um, and will be made available. Next slide. So there we go, that's just an example uh, from the Changing Face of Worcester um, page. So those images have been uploaded to, to Changing Face of Worcester so that the volunteers can remotely work 
on the, the, the descriptions for that in the background. And you can see here, this one has actually already got a description in there. You probably can't uh, actually read it from uh, from the screen, uh, but that just gives a, that sort of depth of description there that we're then able to search on in the new resource. Uh, and that photograph is one of um, the Coach and Horses pub on the Tithe. Next slide. So I mentioned all of those additional resources that have come to light and that we're drawing on um, through the, um, the course of this project. And here's another collection of photographs that, um, that the, the Historic Environment Record has acquired over the last, um, the last few years. These are photographs, again, that supported um, the planners and conservation team uh, and they're currently sitting in the, um, the basement of, um, the, of uh, the Worcester City Museum. Um, in, in those blue folders, as you can see, um, we've also been really fortunate to have the support of a um, work placement, Naomi Taylor, uh, from the, the University of Worcester, and she's been uh, systematically going through these folders um, and just um, sort of um, verifying what we have there, uh, checking on copyright permissions, because the whereas the um, the core of our uh, collection um, was all uh, is made up of, of photographs that were taken by uh, city council officers, so we know the copyright of that and know that we can make it available. This material is quite a mixed bag. There's there's some material in there that has been taken by um, planning officers and conservation team, but some of it is material that that has been acquired from elsewhere. So she's doing an amazing job sorting through that and identifying the material that we can then have digitised and again be made available via Know Your Place. Next slide. Uh, and another collection there on the left hand side, we have um, a photograph from the Tom Marsden collection. Uh, Tom was uh, the public health inspector in Worcester. So this collection really uh, looked more at the, um, the slum clearance areas of the city. So he was looking at areas that, that would be um, identified as, as um, not meeting sort of the, the requirements of human uh, human habitation, really. Uh, uh, so so a lot of those those uh, buildings that are shown there were demolished in the 1960s. And this is just a lovely evocative image um, of one of the people that lived in the, the blockhouse area of the city. This is June Jones and her daughter, baby Debbie there uh, on her hip. And it's just a lovely image of, of life at, at, at that time, really. Uh, so that's another collection that's come to light um, through the last few months and that we've actually had digitised and is now being made available online. And then on the right hand side there is just an example of a couple of photographs that local people have contributed over the last few months. Um, so just really showing the value of um, that sort of crowdsourcing approach and going out and asking people what material they have as well that they might like to contribute. So those are photographs of the Tybridge Street area of the city. Um, alongside those, we also have a number of oral histories. So um, people have, have written in to us and, and shared um, written memories, but we've also had a number of uh, audio um, recordings sent to us, um, many of those by Clive Haynes of um, the uh, Changing Face of Worcester uh, project. Uh, he and his brother Malcolm originated the, um, that, that collection of material, the Changing Face Forced material. And you may remember some of the slideshows that they, uh, they ran in the, the 1980s, many years ago now, um, that was popular with local people. So again, that's that the ability to share audio is really important and something that we want to do via the new platform. Next one. So that brings us really to uh, Know Your Place Worcester and that, um, that, that wish to, to make not only all of that amazing uh, collection of material available online, but support that by local people's contributions. So I'm at this point going to bow out and hand over uh, to Pete, Pete Insult. I think he's there. I am, I am yes. Hello, hello everyone. Um, thank you very much, Sheena. And, um, and I'm joining you from sunny Bristol, the uh, uh, down the seven from, 
from you. It's quite interesting how Worcester is number seven and, and we are just about our city boundary borders the River Seven. So that's quite a nice connection we've got between our two cities. And uh, yeah, I'm very delighted to join you this afternoon at this launch of this of these of these two platforms. But and I'm very pleased that uh, Know Your Place Worcester joins our family of Know Your Places. Um, we, this is the ninth Know Your Place. Uh, there's eight others in the in the west of England, and Worcester now joins us, so a little bit further north. And what I'm going to do is um, share my screen and show you Know Your Place Worcester, how it works, um, and then show you um, Know Your Place Bristol, uh, because Know Your Place Worcester is just the beginning of a journey. And I think if you see Know Your Place Bristol, uh, that's been going for 10 years now, and you'll see what what potential there is in a platform like this. Uh, because as 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 you've already heard from Sheena and I heard yesterday from, from various the other talks yesterday, these stories are everywhere. And what these two platforms really make the connection is between people and places. And it's it's that that connection between people and places that really kind of helps embed these stories, shows the value of these stories to families, wider communities, and so on. And I think Know Your Place has, has a role within that. And I think the connection with the Life Stories platform is, is, is really important as well. So let me just show you what Know Your Place Worcester actually will look like. Um, if I find it on here. I will now pick it up. Hopefully you can all see that. Oh, that's the Bristol version. Let me go, this is the Worcester one. Sorry, I went to Bristol. So there's the Worcester, um, know your place. And at the moment, um, the website just has the modern map you see here at Worcester today. And the green diamonds here, this is what we call the community layer because when we started Know Your Place, we were really keen that people could share their own information, their own images, their own stories of places. And so we've allowed, we allow this kind of crowdsourcing approach for people to upload this, this information to the website. So that's, that's what you see. And this will continue, I'm sure, with Worcester's Know Your Place, that whenever you go to the site, you get the modern map and you get green diamonds. And you'll see the Bristol version in a minute. You'll see that on Bristol now, the map is covered in these green diamonds. The map is designed to work just like you would do on, a, on, on any online map, like Google Maps. You click and drag the map around. And when, we, when the site develops, those historic maps that Gina was showing you will eventually be available on this left-hand side, which is what we call the comparison map. And that will be able to be revealed by dragging that comparison map over the top of the modern map. So you can imagine that's a, that would be a historic map once we've uploaded those to the site. At the moment, it's just another version, a nice colourful version of the uh, modern on survey map. You can zoom in and out like you would do on Google with these plus and minuses at the top of the screen here. And then if you access the information on any of these green diamonds, you just click the diamond and it would show you uh, the information that's, that's on there. So in this case, it's a photograph that's been uploaded to the site and you can view a, a larger version of that image by uh, by clicking the thumbnail. Close that, and then this little arrow here will take you through to whatever information has been uploaded or a description or a longer description about that, that image. And I noticed this morning, if we scroll up here or zoom out, there's some additional images at the top at the moment on the community layer related to Worcester City Football Club. And so this, amongst these things, shows you the range of information that can be uploaded. So there's a PDF of the Worcester City Football Club story. There's also uh, an audio clip, I noticed. So that is a link to an audio uh, clip in there. And as Sheena was saying, uh, there's other collections can be added as layers, what we call layers on the map. And as already, these photographs have already been populated on that layer. And again, just like with the green diamonds, if you want to see any of the images from those collections, you just click the point on the map and then you can see the image. Although I noticed yesterday, what was at the moment what it is doing is actually downloading the image to your computer at the moment. But when it's 
when it's actually running, we'll be able to act, work in exactly the same way as the community layer. You'll be able to display that larger version of the image by clicking that thumbnail. Now, if I show you, well, the other thing, just to, the other thing that Sheena did mention was the historic environment record, which is Sheena's world, um, which uh, they've added. In, that information has also been added, both in terms of polygons, so the shapes on the map, the coloured shapes here, or the points have been added to the name place Wor Worcester. And just like the images, if you click any of those points, it takes you through to the, uh, in, the further information. And there's also this a uh, nice feature of a link through to uh, more, even more information about that record uh, by clicking there. i just show you the Bristol one. Now, um, this helpfully zoomed to my location. So yesterday when I opened it uh, for the, the, uh, the launch yesterday, it actually showed central Bristol, but this is actually where I live. This is my part of the city. And even in my area, this is, this is sort of a, an inner city suburb, if you like, um, you'll see that there's even here we've got green diamonds scattered around that members of the public have added. And just like you've seen on the Worcester Know Your Place, these are photographs members of the public have uploaded that just shows a scene from um, this part of the city. And in many instances, these are photographs that you won't find anywhere else. And it, apart from the actual physical uh, photograph in someone's personal collection. So they've been scanned and someone has actually uploaded it to the site. So that's the end of my road, actually, uh, back in the 1980s when it was, it was, it was semi-derelict. And as I explained about um, I know your place, Worcester, eventually you'll be able to do this. So this is the 1880s 1 to 2500 map that Sheena mentioned. That's provided by the National Library of Scotland. And it allows us to really get a sense of how much an area has changed or how little it has changed since since these times and just like any other part of the site you can zoom in and you, and once you when you zoom into these historic you just get a sense of how beautiful these things are and most people who are right we've done surveys about the use of know your place and something like 80 percent of people just want to look at these old maps and why wouldn't you they're beautiful things i mean the fact that they've plotted on these individual trees in people's garden uh, it's just joy really the other, like I say, going forward, you'll see we've got the information layers here, but then you will, you will be able to get access to additional base maps. This is what's called a base map here. And so on the left-hand side is the comparison map. You can give it a look at other different date maps. So if I, say here, I can look at an even earlier map. Again, you can do the comparison through here. You can also do a transparency. There's a transparency tool here where you can really get a good indication of how a place has changed or not, like I've said before. I mentioned about the uploading of information. Um, that is a really straightforward process, or I, I think it's straightforward. But if you do get there's a help and information on the menu, and all of these links will take you through to our guidance documents that we created that talk you through the process of actually uploading information. But it is just a simple thing of clicking the tool as a pencil tool up here. It says create a new record on the pop-up. You click on the map and then you can go to create a new record and enter information into uh, the form. And it gives you some indication about the type of information we, we suggest you should upload to the site. I always say when they get to the description, as you see some, from some of the other records, the description is not, we don't suggest people write, write an essay into there. Imagine a, a, what the user would like to see in, in that, in that, uh, in that pop-up when they click the image. And then you can choose a file to upload, which can be a, um, a JPEG image or a, or a PDF, or as I said before, a, an audio file as well. And then you click submit and in Bristol, it would be me doing a validation of that information, make sure there's no swear words or anything in there. And in Worcester, I'm, I'm sure she will do, do a similar job. One of the things it's I didn't mention yesterday, but I think it's quite a useful thing that's been added into Know Your Place, and it's going to be the same in Know Your Place Worcester, is this ability to add a URL. It's those fields on the form that will be useful to create a link between 
know your place and Worcester life stories because I can imagine, as you'll hear later on about uh, the, you know, the Worcester life stories um, platform, I think there there will be these links between the two platforms that I think are quite important uh, to say about people and places and stories are connected between people and places. And that URL link will be able to link through to the Worcester Life Stories platform. I think it's quite a, a useful, useful tool. Just, I said, in terms of a 10-year journey that we've been on in Bristol, this is the list of collections we have now got on the site here on the menu on the right-hand side here. And all of those collections have been added by members of the public, and they are just the same as the community layer in terms of we have had a team of volunteers working through these collections that are either from the city archives or they're from personal collections. So right now there's a, a personal collection here, the Lewis collection, which is gradually being added by volunteers, um, which we originally saw on Flickr, and we've contacted the person who owned those collections of photographs from the 1970s and 60s and 70s, and we're add, gradually adding them to the site. But just like with the... Um, the community layer you put a tick in the box here and it switches the layer on and once it's got we're wearing around i'll just go to where i know there's some postcards at the end of the street this is a collection of three and a half thousand postcards from the city archives that volunteers were able to pin to the map just like community layer images just like i showed you with that pencil tool there and they're just these postcards from the mostly late 19th or early 20th century that just like those images that Sheena was showing you, show Bristol at times and these places, how they've changed or not, not changed at all. So that church is still at the end of my street. These houses have gone. If you look at Street View now at the same location, at the bottom of Ashley Hill, you'll see these, some of these buildings are the same, but then you'll see that some of these shops are long gone because of road widening and other, other things. So I think I've given you a little taster of... of what Naya Place Worcester will look like and what the potential of the platform will be in the future. I will hand back to uh, Thanks to very else. much, Pete. That's great. And um, hopefully you'll, you'll be with us at the end for um, questions and answers if, um, if people have questions for you. Is that right? Absolutely. I'll, I'll be here till the end, yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Great. Right, so I shall hand over then to, to you, Tash. Thanks, Shane. Has that come back up with the uh, presentation? Thank yeah. you. Um, Pete, you know, I, I said yesterday in terms of, ah, oh, your, your video's gone. I hope you're going to stay on video um, in terms of seeing your, your face. But um, what I was... What I was going to say is that there's something about how you describe Know Your Place that I think really makes a difference. And for me, and for listening to, to what you said in terms of the potential between the two platforms is, uh, or, or what the platforms can, can bring is where my heart sings really. Because I think when you speak, I hear that bit about making a difference to people. And when I think about why I wanted to be involved in this project, um, is the, the difference that potentially telling stories makes. Okay, and I think that that's the thing. And if I go back, so to say a little bit in terms of my background, um, I used to be uh, an inpatient psychologist. I've actually been an older adult inpatient psychologist for the last 10 years. Um, not always in Worcester. I used to work in the black country um, on the inpatient ward there. And we used to have a historian that would come um, and I've shared this story before, but for me, it's really important because he used to come and talk about the city of, of Wolverhampton and people would come together, not unlike how Pete, you know, when you were just describing about where you lived, people had that opportunity to connect over that shared experience and, and what it felt like um, and that sort of sense of empowerment and connection and attachment and the things that make us us. And I think one of the reasons, so when I moved to Worcester, 
I couldn't find anything like that. Now, um, I owe a slight apology there because um, since I've been here, there's actually lots and I need to, to recognise museums uh, Worcestershire and they're not here in the archives. Actually, there's there's some really brilliant resources that we're starting to to, to see as well as know your, know your place. And I know they're, they're coming online, but I remember phoning Sheena from the ward at Athlone in Worcester and saying, I'm on the bed, borrow and steal for a similar experience because we know about those shared stories. Um, and Sheena, and I won't, you know, re repeat what they've both just said about knowing, uh, saying about Know Your Place Worcester, uh, sorry, Know Your Place Bristol and, and the potential for that in Worcester. And that got me thinking about life packs. So the first thing for the life stories platform was um, as somebody that worked on awards or if you work in care homes or even if you're um, at home, sometimes it can be really hard to find things. Um, and things are really busy and, and Polly mentioned this yesterday in terms of people not having time. And one of the things that I've spoken about is I don't have the knowledge, I don't have the memory for a start, Pete. Sometimes when I listen to you and Sheena in terms of, you know, your, your knowledge, but it stops people. And one of the things that I really wanted was um, self-contained packs which enabled people, myself, a support worker, a nurse that where they'd be able to go on and the things that they were saying, you know, you could access images, videos, written memories that could help share some of those stories. And Glenn Harding, um, Pete mentioned it earlier, he's he's provided some of that information. So it says self-contained life pack. So you have two options in terms of if you're a busy support worker, you can you can go on and it's self-contained in one area and you can just download it or go on to know your place. Um, Museums Worcester have offered their suitcase stories and that's going to continue to grow. That's a, an opportunity to um, come together over a shared experience. So that was one part in terms of the life stories platform were these life packs. But for me, as a when I worked on the wards, as Sheena and I were talking and thinking about the, the Know Your Place site and one of the things that I used to do is when people would come into hospital, sometimes um, if you're living with dementia, you can um, become distressed, upset, and you may not be able to tell somebody what's going on in terms of what might be triggering that. And part of my role would be about finding that out and supporting somebody. Um, and one of the ways that we can do that is we're all individual. Uh, Polly talks about a handbag exercise. I talk about routines. I was thinking last night, um, I, uh, I always sleep with the window open. It does not matter if it's the middle of winter and it's, it's minus 10 degrees. I, I, the, the sense of ventilation I need, we're all individual. And, and part of my role would have been um, to find out about a person, to talk with them and with their families and, and everyone else to, to do that. And I was thinking about the stories that we've shared. So some of my experiences were, um, I remember a gentleman, um, he used to work, in, he was a singer in a pub um, and he had an amazing voice, but what would happen is towards evening time, of course, he'd put his coat on to, to go um, to go singing. And, and because we knew that, we would play the music that he used to play um, and he would sing on the ward and he did. He had this just an incredible voice. Um, and I just I remember another time where a um, it was an Italian family and his wife had started to stop visiting the ward. And when we explored it with them, she was worried in terms of the level of distress that um, he would become upset when she was leaving. And we were talking in terms of their experiences, their life together, the things that they used to do differently. And um, she said to me uh, that when she'd go shopping, he used to have a, a little espresso uh, cup and he'd wave her off. Um, and that, that was her job and, and, you know, and he would sit and have an espresso. So, so what we did was we had the espresso cup come in and the coffee. Um, and as their time together would come to an end, we would, um, make a drink and then we would start chatting and his wife would just say she was off to, to do any of the things that she would, you know, that she needed to do. And he'd wave her off and they were able to say goodbye and have that moment together without the worrying and, and that just enabled them to sort of keep together and we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't asked them and we had the little cup on on the ward or 
I don't know, it's funny. I think I've, I've thought of so many more stories since uh, Polly's yesterday. We had this brilliant staff nurse who, um, with this gentleman who in his hometown, um, they used to do festivals um, and she just went on Google, uh, typed it in, found the festival online on, on YouTube and then they would play it together um, and that was an opportunity just to, to come together over something that was meaningful for him. She learned so much, I learned so much. And when I think about the Life Stories platform and the, and the work that Verse One have done, can I just give credit to them now? I didn't do this enough yesterday. Um, the, what it will enable is some of the, some of the experiences that, that I've just spoken about is being online will make a difference. You'll be able to access that music. You'll be able to have that YouTube clip. You'll be able to more easily access those memories. It will make things more accessible. You'll have access to different mediums that you wouldn't have had before. And I need to be careful because I don't want to, I keep thinking about Polly's um, presentation and not going on with that. But these were some of the reasons why I wanted this platform to, to happen, you know, in terms of where it would make a difference. So a little bit in terms of our journey, I can't do as great as Sheena with, with photographs and stuff. You've got one, one slide from me. Um, but how do you take an idea into where we are today? And I just wanted to give some acknowledgement to people. And I, I forgot to mention Andrew Hasler yesterday. I noticed Polly tweeted about people she hadn't acknowledged. Um, where I went to him and said, look, you know, we're thinking about this project. This is the platform we want to do. And he was like, great. Have we spoken to Sam Monday? She's the person that can help digital solutions go ahead. Um, and Sam actually, I think, was one of the turning points within it for the Life Stories platform for us in that she got the whole project and was able just to say, look, this is this is where we, you know, we, we, we're going to back you on this, really, in terms of taking it forward. Um, I have to, and I said at the beginning, in terms of just recognising the, the local organisations that supported both platforms and the wider project. So the Association of Carers, Platform Housing, Plus, which is now Reconnections, who said, this will make a difference for the people that we work with and we support you in that. I mean, I was thinking, you know, just, I've worked with people where, capturing their life story has been actually they want to share it in terms of um, passing it on to family members. Um, th th there are so many ways that can make a difference and I don't have enough time to be able to tell you all the different ways and across all the different, um, you know, across the lifespan and, and different needs. And then I guess, um, and I can see you, Chris, and I was thinking about just that acknowledgement and what, what we'd said in terms of when we spoke with developers, what was different about Verse One is they got the project, they wanted to be involved, and Chris mentions this later, they even invested their own funds in terms of the innovation fund, because this is brand new, you know, there isn't anything else like this out there. That's why I don't have a, this is one we did earlier, this was something that we had to create. So, um, so with that in place, the, as people may be aware, I can see a number of people that have joined our, our online sort of workshops. There's having an idea and then making sure it actually reflects what people wanted. So those workshops have been about, um, okay, what would an online life story look like? Polly will go on later to say there are many different ways that you can do that. We do it differently on the ward. You know, I'd, I'd think about them differently. So we asked people, Shirley Evans, who isn't here today, helped us think about um, digital inclusion, um, what the font sizes would be like. A number of people contributed in terms of shaping what the platform is today. Um, and without them, it wouldn't be what it is today. And then, and then came the hard work. So um, I can see that Mark, I can definitely see that Mark's on, who's one of the developers, who probably has hated me in the last couple of weeks if I email him at 10 o'clock saying, I've just wondered about this, can we add this in? Um, and, you know, they've, they've, just to credit to them, everything that I've kind of thrown, they've at least said, well, we'll think about this or, you know, about this kind of going forward. And then um, I guess I wanted to go with a thank you because I know you see uh, Sheena and I in terms of the wider project um, and 
uh, myself in terms of the Life Stories platform, and I'm not in the room with them, so this is even harder, but I acknowledged them yesterday and I want to do the same again today. There are so many people involved in this project that, that we don't necessarily hear about, but for me, there's been a, an NHS project team, for a better word, and without Catherine, without Laura, without Leslie, who I don't know in terms of... Um, uh, Pete, you mentioned earlier about URLs and linking and, and, and APIs, and I haven't got a clue. I've had to do so much learning from a technical point of view, but there have been people behind me that have made sure those sorts of things that happen, and I think I just wanted to recognise them. So the three pictures that you see is we dedicated a tree, um, and I was thinking about what Polly said yesterday. Uh, both of us are... Um, uh, psychologists that believe in the power of stories and how stories change and quite often we use trees in terms of recognizing our roots and where we come from the, the trunk can be about um, the skills and the resources that we have our branches are what's important to us our hopes for the futures and the gifts that we give so I think there was something about me wanting to plant trees for people that just recognizes and comes back to the connection of stories I'm going to try and not go on too much. I realise I've spoken more than last time. You know, you, you, every time you do something, you just embellish it a bit more, don't you? But um, Polly can't be here with us today. And we recorded the from the launch yesterday in terms of her presentation. We did have a number of technical difficulties. It drops out a couple of times and her voice goes a bit squeaky. But they're rare. They don't happen, but the feedback that we had was Polly's presentation in a way that I just can't do um, spoke to, I guess, some of the rawness and um, why life story is important. It talks of, She talks in terms of some of the considerations we need to think about, but also sometimes when we might not do it. What I'd like to do with everyone's permission is to, to show you that and I ask that you just bear with some of those technical difficulties because they are just moments you have to tolerate me saying I'm sorry Polly in the beginning we've got some technical difficulties but over the course you'll get to hear the reason why we still wanted to show you um, Polly's presentation. Then I'm going to hand over to Chris and Sue who I have to say do a fabulous job in terms of just showing what the Life Stories platform can do. And I think going back to Pete's point earlier, um, I think both platforms not only have so much potential now, but there's so much that they can do. And both Sue and, and Chris talk to that in terms of what's possible. Um, so at this point, Sheena said shut up, but I think that might be quite bad language. I'm, I'm going to move to say I'm going to be quiet I'm going to move it along to Polly's presentation and then I'll close that down and then hand over to, to Chris and Sue. So thank you, everyone. And bear with me and hope this works because I tested it earlier. So let's see. Brilliant. So, yeah. I am so sorry that we can't meet in person and that I can, can't be in Worcester to get an amazing feel of your of your city. Um, home, I understand, of Lee and Perrin's Worcester sauce, I use a lot. Glove making and a real love favourite of mine, Brother Cathal. Um, also home to Worcester University, where you have Professor Dawn Brooker, who's led in the field of dementia studies uh, for a long time. Um, so I'm deep. Bye. Uh, so thank you. We're so sorry, everybody. Unfortunately, we're having significant difficulties with the Wi Fi here. I'm just going to, to restart sharing. I'm apologies, Polly. That's okay. Let's talk to the second slide. And, um, so, uh, as Tash said, uh, my name's I'm Polly Kaiser. Um, it's loads where they all click in. I think you have to click. I thought it was, if you click everything, it'll come in. I'm a clinical psych, consultant clinical psychologist, um, member of the National Faculty uh, of Psychology for Older People, FPOP, um, which I think there are a couple of other members on here today. I was a founding director of the National Life Story Network, 
and a former lead for mental health and later life at NMHDU, the Department of Health. I'm also a wife, mum, daughter, sister, friend, lecturer, and my hair has grown a lot since that photograph due to lockdown. So, in terms of roots um, and stories, if you go on to the next slide, I'm going to just read out the roots for me uh, to life story. Oh, a lot to this man, Ken, um, Ken Holt and his wife, Alice. And I just think this quotation from T.S. Eliot, time present and time past are both present in time future, contained in time past, and time future contained in time past, just summarises so much of what you've already spoken about today with the history. And it's absolutely fascinating total labour of love and I'm absolutely fascinated by heritage and history so um, I'd love to dig and delve on those maps but anyway um, so the roots for me as a, as a practitioner as a psychologist I tried to encourage other members of staff to do life story work when I first qualified but staff were always very very busy um, and then when I started in Oldham in 2002 on my first day I met Ken and we clicked and we we bonded and we talked and we listened to each other. Um, and Ken was a great communicator and connector and organiser. And his vast experience of local politics and community groups meant he had good relationships with people and he wasn't afraid to speak his mind. Um, he and Alice met during the war and they married in 1946. And they shared so many interests and great love motorcycling and involved in setting up all kinds of um, national motocross associations, local cubs and scouts. Alice received a diagnosis of dementia. Ken, being an activist, kind of threw him into this into this work, and that's the forum in which I met met with him. So when his wife needed to eventually go into a care home, um, Ken, who knew her so well, obviously, didn't write a huge life story; just wrote a couple of pages or nuggets of information that he thought the staff would find helpful. Um, he knew what was important for staff to know. He knew of her wartime fears when she would often stay dressed at night in case she had to go and make a quick dash to the air raid shelter. And some nights she would stay dressed come what may. Ken was able to let staff know that this was part of her story. So of course staff could then realise this is why Alice needs to stay dressed at night. Not knowing that history, staff might prescribe unnecessary tranquilizers to calm her down. Instead, they could see the world from her point of view. No more bedtime agitation when staff brought out her nightdress. And I just think that's a real root story to, to share. And, that, and that's where we started in Oldham uh, with, with an Oldham Life Story group, um, Penn's Vision for a National Life Story Network. So if you'd like to continue, what I'd like to do normally, if we were with each other, I, I, I do something I call a handbag exercise. And don't worry, gentlemen, you don't have to have a handbag to do this. You can choose an object in your desk, on your desk, in your pocket, something that's important to you. I just want you all to look around and choose an object that is important to you. Um, take a few minutes. And think, why is it important to you? When you've had a moment to find something, if you feel able to, just in the chat, say, say why it's if, if, only if you feel comfortable to. You want to just share what what it is and why it's important. Normally, we do this in pairs, and we take a lot longer. So, excuse the online aspect of it. But for any of you who feel comfortable doing that, that would be great. What if people? found. You start writing or shout out, I guess, but diary, friends, photos, car keys, yes. Pencil care, yep. Yeah. My oh lovely friend made it for me. And of those hairbrush, I love it. I can sometimes get lipstick actually. That gun and set because it was a present. Oh how diary need to know where I'll be and what I'm doing. Absolutely, necklace, connection, wonderful. Those things that are important to you, but other people know that they are important to you. 
if you just think, or is it just you that knows it's important, or does anyone else know? If you write yes or no, just probably not really, yeah. Anyone else? Do, do people know? No. So they're really important to you, and yet people around you may or may not know that they are. And I guess, yeah, so <laughs> DIY. So some of people might know what's important to you and others don't, but I think it's that variability that's really important. But think something that might be really important to you, no one else knows that we need to share for our well-being and our kind of sanity and safety and connection. So I'll, it, that's just a little taster, really. A, of doing a bit of life story. Normally we'd have conversations and we'd have connections and that's a whole exercise in itself. But thank you for the snippets of those of you who've shared um, what, what's important. And if, um, and if you go on to the next slide, Tash, I think what all of you have said links to connection. It connection with your granddad and the binoculars. It links to it links to your family. It links to your car and being able to get to see family and friends. Your phone, um, speaking to people. It's presence. It is all all of those things in one way or another link to connection or something that's really important to you, like a hairbrush or lipstick, which might seem frivolous, but actually isn't if it's about your well-being. Um, that might be really, really important. And I think for me, um, life story work and the work you're doing here is all about connection. Thank you. So what? why is um, life story important and why now? There's been such a growth of it uh, over, the, over the years and, and the kind of hunger, thirst and excitement for it has outpaced um, research. And lots of us in the background been doing research, people like Bob Woods and, and others. Um, so there hasn't really been a consistent definition of your story work, but an earlier one, and, and I, want, I think it is important to acknowledge roots and history. So if you go to the next slide, Tash, um, Tash and I were talking the other day, um, you, uh, uh, and in health social work, Charlie Murphy up in Scotland at the dementia, uh, the Stirling Dementia Unit, um, had a conversation with a, a person that about the seaside and the seashell, and that unleashed a life story with that person. And he was one of the trailblazers in terms of life story work and dementia. And that was very much in a health and social care context, and very much about using the person's past to help them in the present. However, as time's moved on, the definition has moved on. And if you go to the next slide, <coughs> and Tash, the um, definition that um, we co-created with a story network. Can you move it on, Tash, or not? Maybe not. I'll read, I'll read the definition out, really. Um, it, it's that life story work is above all a process that involves having helpful conversations to elicit and capture and use life stories about a person in order to promote their personhood. And that's where we link to the work of Tom Kitwood and the Worcester University, the work of Professor John. That idea of person blazed. Ideas about keeping, helping people to keep connected, not only with themselves, but their family, friends, and their communities. So very much um, our definition in our book is about connection with community and have the power um, and that the, the underlying theme for all kinds of life story work is the power and potential of stories to improve the quality of life. The people, particularly with the diagnosis of dementia, which is 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 the work we were doing, and uh, so there you go. It, it's evolved. Not it's come out of health and social. It's used in health and social care, but it's much broader than that, and it, and is is much more for community and for the future. So the next slide talks a bit more about that, 
And this is what, what, what is live story. It's continuous. And that's what about your platform, that it can be adapted and added to different members of the family, different photographs, different people from abroad might be able to get involved and add their stories and add their layers. And it doesn't just involve looking back on the past, and I know you've got all that rich historical data, also to future hopes. And one colleague and friend of mine talked about a woman who had always hoped to have tea at the Ritz, and she was in a care home, and she was reaching her last days. And what they did in the care home is they recreated the ambiance of the Ritz. They had the tablecloth, the tiered cakes, the, the, pot, the posh pot of tea and the teacups and the music, and they had a tea party in the care home with all the danger of the Ritz. And that lady died. She'd had her wish come true, even at the end of her life. So the hope and future hopes are still really important to capture. That might be an extreme future hope. I had another lady who wanted to go to have tea at the Grand Hotel, and I found out a card from her from America. So it doesn't have to be about end of life hopes. There are future hopes. Often it's done on a one-to-one -one basis, basis historically, particularly in the care sector, um, but it doesn't have to be. And I, um, yeah, and stories what people can do. I'll come back to that really important. It can be an A4 sheet, a timeline, pictures, a scrapbook, a book, a DVD, memory. But here online, the launch for today, uh, it's really important as well to say it's not just for people with dementia or people in health and care. I couldn't find a picture, a photograph of it. Frank, who took over from Ken as the chair of the Life Story Group in Oldham, and he is in his 80s, he runs a radio show, and he did Life Story work for his wife, Betty. And um, he did one for his granddaughter when she was 18, and then he updated it when she was 21. And then some of her friends said, oh, do you think your granddad would do me a Life Story book? So I think it, it's not something just for old age and just for reminiscence, reminiscence, you know, kind of 40s and 50s and anniversaries. He's, the stories are captured at any age. And I think the stories of community are really important as well. And I'll come on to talk about that in a, in a moment. So the next slide talks a little bit about concerns. You know, if, if you can go to the next slide. Um, it, it's never, it's not finished. Uh, it's never finished. And often people have used it in, in ceremonies for funerals, um, oops. Okay, it's not a finished story, and it's not just reminiscence, or obviously, old reminiscence. And it's not therapy, but it is therapeutic, as, as, as I've been talking about. And it doesn't have to be chronological. Um, I, I hate to say that to you, historian, you know, historians, it's time, time present and time past are very present here. I once did my life story using the London Underground because I had different memories of different stations over the years. So it was very non-linear. Um, uh, uh, and my sister's done one, of, uh, uh, is a singer-songwriter, has done one about our mother song, very, very non-linear. Uh, so it doesn't have to be chronological. And also, it's not always right for everybody. Not everybody wants it, or not everybody, one, one patient on the wall said, I don't want anyone digging and delving in the drawers. So, so, so the assistant had to kind of find pictures about things. She, she made, she'd been a seamstress, wedding dresses, but she didn't have photographs of those wedding dresses, but she found photographs of wedding dresses and other books to make it, um, uh, you know, she loved horses, she didn't have a photograph of her horse, but she found a photograph of a horse that then sparked conversation. But it's not always, and my dad used to have done despite my passion for it. So it's not always right for everyone. Um, so the next slide then speaks about something that's really, really important to me. Um, uh, as I don't have many family in this country in terms of kin, kith are really important to me. That old phrase kith and kin and it comes from the German origin meaning known and it's about your homeland where you live your native region the relationships you have and the knowledge about that environment it's very much about the geography of place so the know your place really speaks to those echoes of, of thought I've had about kith they're your friends acquaintances neighbors people who certainly from 
lockdown have become increasingly important connections. And um, so the while well, the kin of the people you're related to, and historically we may have turned to to do life story work, what I've seen and heard about your wonderful platforms is it's about it's drawing in kin and all your volunteers and all those relationships and all that shared knowledge of community is absolutely fantastic. Um, so that really um, spoke to my heart today. So just in terms of a framework um, that Ruth and I developed um, and wrote about in our book, it, we, we developed other people have these models called five P's and I thought I want a five P model. So I created one. <laughs> this is my five P model where you have the person at the centre and it depends on what the purpose of the life story work is. Uh, you know, we have certain principles regarding it and the processes and depending on that will determine the product so that your product may not be right for everybody but it will be right for a lot of people so if we go on i'll just talk you through those if i may um yeah so i'll talk pen and alice um this man on the right is george and, and his daughter Jean totty who was also founding director of the live story network and um the privilege of supporting George and having his life story done in Oldham and he was a draftsman by trade but absolute artist loved painting and drawing um and his when he when, when he went into a care the care home knew this and bought him art materials so he could draw and then when he moved again he took those with him he could carry on drawing carry on connecting to the thing that he loved doing and he also had family in Scotland so when a care worker was clearing out her cupboards. She found a book on Scotland and took it to George and they could sit down and look at it together, really promoting that connection, knew that snippet of his history. Um, so the principles, um, these are really important um, and are drawn for me and, and I know for, for, for Tash uh, on narrative therapy and narrative practices. And these principles are that stories are really only partial descriptions of our lives. They're only snippets, but they have real effects in shaping our lives and our futures. So, you know, the horrid Henry stories, good child, bad child, those reputational stories have real effects on kids. Um, and the stories around dementia that used to exist um, when I first qualified, I would see people at end stages of dementia on wards, uh, not even dressed in their own clothes. Um, and then as time's gone on, we've had activists like Peter Ashley here in the photograph who, who pioneered the expression in well dementia. And he was the first person with dementia to be part of national dementia strategy. And Agnes Houston up in Scotland, the Scottish dementia group, um, was the first person I heard with dementia speaking at a conference and totally inspired me and continues to inspire me. And here we've got a, a picture as well of, of Keith um, Oliver at number 10 Downing Street, who is a great writer. All of these people have dementia. They are role models um, in the world of dementia and for me as well. Um, and I think those stories are having effects shaping other people coming along with dementia uh, to, to inspire and think and hope for you know, you don't, you're not just a diagnosis, you're still a person, an activist, a mother, uh, a walker, a fisherman, a bird watcher. You're all these other things. Um, so the, these, these stories are socially constructed over time and we're seeing these stories changing. I hope your platform might help to change some of those kinds of stories as well um, and stories of place. So the next slide, just repeat that people, people's lives are multi-story and I have uh, facilitated workshops where I've had participants say, oh, I don't want one life story, I want one for my friends, one for my work colleagues and one for my family because I don't want family knowing what I did there and I don't want my work colleagues knowing about that bit of my life, thank you very much. So somebody wanting three separate life stories and I'm speaking to Tasha earlier, um, she said that that's possible with your platform so you may find that being a really, really useful strategy for the people like that. Um, um, stories, oh, I've realised I've forgotten a, a story about kids. 
but I might come back to that. Um, I'll carry on. Um, so yes, these are questions Elijah, what's helpful? So those stories like um, Wendy, I don't have a picture of Wendy Mitchell, but her book has been serialised on Radio 4. Keith's writing, Agnes's activism, Peter's trailblazing. It's those stories that really help to connect with people. Um, so the other purposes of the stories, if you go on to the next slide, have all kinds of purposes. Um, they're about emotional connection. Uh, and just after I spoke, gosh, this morning, my oldest friend in the whole world WhatsApped me a picture of a school trip we'd been on in 1974 to France. And she went, do you remember this? And it's got this old photograph of my, my you know, school that I was only there for a couple of years. It's so lovely to see. I don't have a lot of, of memories of, of that time. It's all before digital photographs. So it's such a delight to receive that, especially today we're talking about that. So huge emotional connection for me and my friend with that photograph. It provides interactional connections. So for George in the care home with stuff about Scotland, building new connections, practical care connections like the ones I talked about for Alice. Um, also, if you're thinking about multi-story, I was also working with an OT once who, who was working with someone who um, was across the stuff. Um, and he loved dressing in women's clothes, but that was a very private story for him, and not one felt he could share, and one that the daughter felt quite scared. But through doing story work, he was able to have two life stories. He had one of him as him, and one as his cross-dressing self. So I think, we, you know, not to be too heteronormative in, in the kinds of stories that we tell, and when, where, and how we, how we share those. Just wanted to share that as an example of, of another kind of life story. Um, the per and, and this is thanks to the work from Jackie Kindell, a speech and language therapist in the trust that I work. So she's done a lot of work that I acknowledge there. Um, other per the purpose, the next slide is um, somebody that I know and work well and work with. Ray from our own memory service who's given permission for this. He said he's done, he had his life story done. Uh, with him by a speech and language therapist. And he says, if I'm on my own feeling sad, I can look at it and it makes me smile when I remember some of the things I've done. If I had to go into hospital and I couldn't remember things, I think it would help people to, to remember. Uh, I think it would help people, sorry, put my notes now. If I had to go into hospital and I couldn't remember things, it would help people to understand bit more. Um, I think it would help them to connect with what you're feeling and what you're going through. Uh, so he had a number of life stories. Said that this is me that he takes to hospital. He has to go. Uh, um, and then a slide that Tash might be struggling with to find is um, from somebody from the Kent uh, forget me not member who said, I've had a real chance to think about what's most important to me, and that's relationships. It's love. It's that's my relationships. It's love. You know, when I think about the aspects of the objects you had in the in the chat, they're all about connection, aren't they? And I think, especially at this year, that uh, through COVID, we're all learning those lessons in different ways about the importance of our relationships. Um, before, yeah, go on. so products, uh, lots of products out there from books you can buy, files you can make, one profiles, and this is me. Um, and here we have the launch of this, this amazing product too. And the next one, one of my favourites, uh, is um, a, a granddaughter who did a drawing uh, uh, reflecting her grandfather's passions about growing bonsais and he said he, he used to grow them himself from seed and you know when I think about your platform it could be that grandchildren load up pictures like this and, and really give it extra meal and flavour. Um, so two are just examples of a, a bird that you know that this is one of my hand sent me with the birds um, and then some other 
sculpture work uh, done in our day hospital in our life story but as an example and again um doing um photographs of these can always be uploaded can't they so so the process um i'm going to go on to the process the person if to be um, be complex, but it's not just about reminiscence. It is about future hopes. And I just want to remember that person with dementia. So talk to me, my last an old and a neighbour of mine uh, who refused to divulge her age. Don't just talk to me about my past. Talk to me about my future. So I think it, you know, it be re it's really important not to forget that. And just in terms of process again, I just wanted to speak to this slide. People often think, oh my gosh, it's a can of worms. I can't ask people things. What will it open? You're not going to, if someone's upset, you're not going to upset them anymore by asking them a question. Um, they're often interested in talking and sharing stories. Just be sensitive. And the chest of drawers, why a chest of drawers? I come back to Dawn, Professor Dawn Brooker, <laughs> who shared this at the original launch. Um, is our life stories are a bit like the chest of drawers. You know, top top drawer is the stories we'd want to share with anyone. That I'd probably share with you here today, or we'd share with people down the pub or whatever, friends, acquaintances, top stories. Middle drawer, good friends. Bottom drawer are those secrets we, we maybe not share with anybody, uh, uh, except, you know, maybe one or two trusted people, if that. Um, so life story work for me is very much about the top drawer type of stories. It's not necessarily, unless people want to share. Uh, one woman I did a life story with, she said, oh, you made it all too positive. You need to put some of the bad stuff in. And another woman is, who didn't put in about her miscarriages when she first did it, went back and said, I do need to put those in now. I want my family to know about that stuff as well now. So it changes. That's why it's not continuous. And when I shared this metaphor in one of my workshops, one lady said, I don't want you going in the top drawer. I think that's on the top, maybe, but no, you're not even going in the top floor. So everybody has their level and their limits in terms of the kinds of stories they want to share. And I do want to just end with a kids type story, going back to Kim, and knowing knowing the place where the story is. Um, my step grandma was from London, and uh, after the death of uh, of her husband, her beloved husband Bert. She was being uh, assessed by a doctor in the home, and my sister happened to be there. And she suddenly shouted, Get the dog! Get the dog! And the doctor's about to write down visual hallucinations, you know, not very well. And basically, my sister being there said, She means answer the phone, because it's Cockney rhyming, so like mm. dog and bone, bone, get the dog. So that's where the knowledge of place. The knowledge of idioms, the knowledge of whether you say bats, buns, oven bottoms, wherever you, you know, those kind of idioms and language of place and are really vital to know. Um, so know your place is really important and knowing the language of place and knowing those connections and anything that helps vitalize those and bring those to life and that you are is utterly delicious. So what I would say to people is look for gold it's in the stories. It doesn't have to be the whole life story from birth to death. One colleague of mine said, I knew it was time to end this man's life when he told me the name of his fish when he was 11. Now that might have been important to him, but this life story was going on and on and on. Depending on the purpose, you know, from one page profile, this is me, okay, to a legacy document that you want to share with family across the world. It depends on the purpose, but certainly uh, it's the golden nugget stories, the, the bit about Ken sharing about Alice and the air raid, or George and his drawing, or another friend I know with dementia who has a passion for American Native Indians, and his life story is full of stories around that. So it's connection. What are the golden nuggets that can build connection? So I I did, I, I, um, there isn't time to play the video uh, about Henry, but if for those of you who have seen it, is it on it later because it shows the power of knowing someone and the power of collection. And um, lastly, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Real honour to be asked to speak here. 
And if you want to know more, there's more in our book. Thank you everyone for, for um, bearing with the tech difficulties that went throughout that. Um, I've heard Polly speak many times um, and she always gets me, even if I hear the, the exactly the same presentation, which for me now is the third time, but I think she speaks so well. So it's the rawness and the, the connection that she brings that for me comes back to why um, in the work that, that we do or how we go forward is one of the reasons for the Life Stories platform. So what I need to do now is to be quiet, hand over to, to Chris and Sue, so you can see all the hard work that's happened in terms of how we've, we've taken Life Story online. So thank you, Chris and Sue. Thanks, Tash. Um, I hope everyone can hear. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so I, I put a jacket on because my other half likes we're having windows open as well. Anyway, um, I'm Chris uh, and um, I'm the uh, Products and Solutions Officer at Verse One. And with me is Sue, uh, who is uh, in charge of special projects. Uh, and Mark, one of our developers, as Tash earlier mentioned, is on here as well. Uh, we're part of the Verse One team and we're really proud to be powering um, the Life Stories experience. Um, just as a small thing, a poly. Uh, just there uh, talked about you know, life stories being in set connections and my grandparents lived near Worcester, Gloucester so my connection is that midway between Worcester and Bristol I used to go fossil hunting on the banks of the River Severn. Um, blue limestone that's littered with fossils such as ammonites and they're obviously they're often covered with this lovely sheen of iron pyrites you know fool's gold uh, and I found today one box one of the, um, the ammonites that I, I found there nearly sort of 35 years ago so um, there's a there's an ammonite a very small one but you can see it's part of my part of my life story, past and present, that I can share with you all. So um, <laughs> I'm going to um, quickly talk about you know, the life stories. Um, and so I can only see um, the life stories demo. I can't see the slides on your screen. So, um, <laughs> so we'll actually, you know, it's probably highlighted in the presentation um, and Tash has reinforced its core. The, the life stories platform is about you know, creating your story, uh, engaging with others to enrich it, and then being able to, to publish it to show other people, to share with others in your friends and community. Um, and, to, you know, the provision of therapeutic applications in the community and to empower people to enrich their lives is really at the heart of you know, modern caring and healthcare. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about Verse One, we, we Verse One was founded to use innovative technologies to make a positive impact on people's lives. Um, this is our, our heritage and remains tr as true today as it did when our, our founder and executive chairman started the company. Um, so since 2004, we've used you know, innovative technology platforms to deliver digital solutions that automate tedious work practices and freeing up time for staff in the NHS, particularly to care, uh, and empower patients to become active partners in their own health outcomes. And um, we work with over 50 NHS organisations to do this and understand who they are delivering the solutions. And this is part of the, um, the process we went through with Tash and her team. Um, and as we said, in, in line with our founding principle of improving people's lives, we also help to develop new initiatives to, through our Verse One Innovation Fund. Um, and through this vehicle, we've, we've helped a number of projects, including a, a virtual reality calm room for young people in Cornwall as part of the Suena project, uh, and through pot funding the uh, Life Stories application, which we're about to show to you. Um, so in Herefordshire and Worcestershire County Trust approached us with, the, with this great idea. We were really excited about the potential of the platform uh, and how it could benefit others. And I think we've really enjoyed working with uh, close with Tash, Sheena and the, the rest of the team. And of course, um, many of you who attended the, the earlier workshops, um, working on how we could build a platform that would be really enjoyable to use, you know, accessible to everyone, uh, and that would promote wellbeing and inclusion through empowering people to share their stories you know, with, uh, in Polly's words, their kith and kin. Um, being able to share some rich media, audio, videos, images, as well as text was hugely important. And whilst the platform will work on all devices, we imagine the primary interface being being iPads. Other brands of tablet are, of course, available. Uh, as size and this, this direct, the pun, digital connection of touchscreen devices provide a connection for people, even for those such as my stepmother, um, who otherwise don't do computers. Um, so. Um, there are a number of features we wanted to look at. Life Stories really um, you know, has a, a great um, a great benefit across a number of different areas. So for the user, it's about a sense of achievement, well-being, being able to document and write down your life is hugely cathartic. And it increases the idea of 
personhood, you know, it can help you understand what you've done and remember what you've done. And my memory, like Tash, is also fairly, <laughs> fairly tenuous. Um, and helps them to, you know, connect you with your family, you know, brings you know, an understanding of intergenerational activity, especially when we are, you know, separated in, uh, as we are at the moment. Um, and, you know, being able to help people to understand and contribute to that life story as well and help to pass it down as a, as a generational thing. Um, with carers, it's really good to know who your patients are. Uh, long ago in the mid 90s, I was work working as a junior auxiliary nurse in a care home. And, you know, it's small things like, you know, knowing that someone hates sugar in their coffee can really help to, you know, to make the whole thing more pleasurable for both carers and for people in, in homes as well. And also to help them stimulate their memories. If only we'd had a lot of these digital platforms when I was working in that, um, in that kind of environment, it would have been so much easier. Um, you know, and um, it really helps to communicate with clinicians um, and it helps people to understand and know their patients, even when, you know, patients may have lost the ability to speak conventionally. Um, so, you know, I, I think that this is a hugely beneficial platform. And so, you know, we try to concentrate on making something that is not complex, uh, that you know, uh, has a quick and easy, gu easy guided sign up process so that you can get to the pleasure of you know, creating your life story. Um, you know, writing your words and adding your images and videos and, and audio, um, including from curated you know, content like the life packs that Tash mentioned. Um, and in that way, we've tried to um, give people a head start on their life story. You'll find when you log in, for instance, that you don't get faced with a blank page. You've got some structure to it. You've got some chapter headings like my childhood or my, my work. Um, and, you know, we want to help you to enrich your narrative with, with contributions from others. Uh, and be able to share your story um, and your preferences uh, in a variety of formats with family, friends, community, support workers, you know, all those kith and kin that, that Polly referred to. And the beauty of an online solution, an online digital solution, really, is that, as Polly said, you can continue to develop it wherever, whenever you like, to continue the process of building your story and collaborating with others, recording your past, your present, and your future, uh, whenever and wherever you want to do it. So um, I will now hand over to my colleague, so who will show you how the Live Stories platform allows you to create your story, engage with others to enhance it, and to tell your story by sharing it with your family and community. Thank you, Chris. Um, so as Chris mentioned earlier, we're going to show three different scenarios. One, creating um, a life story. The second one, in using a life story book to engage and communicate. And the third one, creating a book that you can work on as a shared, uh, a shared activity. So as Polly and, and Tash mentioned, life review work and life story work has numerous benefits for the individual at various stages across a person's lifespan. And while the life stories application can be used in a number of different settings, today I'm concentrating on life stories for people living with memory loss. So the activity of creating a life story can help with anxiety, and help the person put their life in context, giving a sense of identity, achievement, leading to an increase in well-being, a feeling of empowerment, and we hope fun. So I'm going to show you. Right, first of all, I'm going to show you how to securely register for the platform, how to create a book, how to upload different types of media, to so have a look at the My Profile page, and then to, to have a, a, an overview of the book in general. So hopefully you can now see this page and I'm sharing the right thing. So um, when you land on the landing page, you've got access here to create a life story. You've also got some more information about life stories in general, a little bit about the project as an overview and links here to Know Your Place, which you were shown earlier and Life Packs, which we've talked about briefly to date but one of the examples that I will go on and show you uses one of those life packs. So let's go ahead and create, start creating a life story. So when you first reach this, if you already have registered, then you'll, you'll jump to your login page. But in this um, example, we haven't yet registered. So all we need to do is to tap here to register and pop in the email address that you want to register with. I'm going to type slowly because yesterday I made loads of typing mistakes. Okay, what happens next is that goes away and sends an email 
and then you get an email in your inbox and you can click on that link there you go move this up so you can see it you click on that link and then you can continue to register so it's asking me for my details now ask you to create a password now for authentication we needed to put in a way of creating a password that was safe and secure so it has got a combination of letters and characters um, and numbers to remember but what we put down here is a little hint so if you can think of a phrase that you can remember easily like mary had a little lamb and maybe the year that you were born then that's something that will help you remember your password when you first set it up. Pop it in twice. The last thing you need to do to register is to put in the GP surgery um, where you are registered and everything from Herefordshire and Worcestershire has been added in here. So as you start typing, the practices will come up you just need to click on which one is yours. You can scroll down the list or as you can see, you can start typing and it will find the relevant practice and click on register. Okay, save my password. You're then presented on the first time and you can see you get an email up here. The first time you are presented with some more information about the Life Stories book. But what we're going to do is skip through that and what we want to do is to start working on our book so the first thing you see is a dashboard and we'll come back to the dashboard um, in a few moments but what i want to do is to start jumping in and start creating our book so if you click on here view and edit here's your book so as chris mentioned what we've done is we've put in some chapters which are just sample chapters so you don't start with an empty book but the first thing we want to do is to give our book a name and to start adding some some images so you click on edit I'm going to put my book here. Wherever you see this little green cross, it means that you can add an image or paste from the internet. Or when you have a library of images that you've used throughout your book, you can select from that too. As soon as you click on here, you'll see here's where you would paste your web address from the internet. Here's where you would choose to upload a picture from the device you're using. And here's where you can pick from your library once, once you've added a few images. So I'm going to go ahead and pick a picture. And this should be here. A little picture of me pre-lockdown when I could get a haircut. Pop that in. Once you've found your, your picture, you get a little preview here to check that you've picked the right one. And you just click to add that to your page. Hopefully my internet will stay up. <laughs> there we go. Right. So there are a couple of options from here. We can save and continue if we want to carry on working on the book. Or we can just save this page and then log out and come back to the book later. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save this page. Okay. Over here we have the chapters that we talked about before. These are just sample chapters so that you don't have an empty book, but we know that not everybody will want these chapters. So you have the ability to delete chapters and pages, to add your own chapters and pages, or you can just rename the ones that are in there, whatever works for you as you build up your book. You can also navigate here on the next bar using the next button, so which I'm gonna do that first. And the first page that you're presented with by default is a page which is this this is me and it's about it's about you these questions have been um, developed based on the this is me profile from the alzheimer's society what i'm going to do here is just start to populate that so whilst my full name is susan i don't like to be called susan i like to be called sue and usually get called Susan if I'm in trouble with my mom. So I'm just going to say, when you talk to me, please call me Sue. I'm going to save and continue. And again, this page can build up over time. So clicking through. The first thing that I may want to do is to talk about growing up. So perhaps I grew up in Worcester. And again, I'm going to pop in here, say growing up in Worcester. 
And I remember um, growing up in Carden Street and there's some lovely images of Carden Street in the Know Your Place files. So again, all I would need to do is click here, find my picture of Carden Street, which is here. That's the right one. Click on that and again, add it to the page. So as well as adding the picture, in this particular instance, I'm going to also add some text. So I'm going to write in here, I remember walking down the street on the way into school. Stepping to sweets. That's my pocket money. And we can save that. So one of the nice things is um, not only being able to add images and add in text, but um, you can also add and record your own voice or somebody else's voice if they're working on the book with you. And we know that um, having the sound of your own voice or a family member's voice can can help be with that, that familiarity and uh, can have a calming effect as well. So if you want to add a voice recording to your page, you click on the options button. You've noticed there's a little record button here. I'll click on record. I remember walking down Carden Street on the way to school and stopping to buy sweets with my pocket money. I always used to pick chocolate if I could, as that was and always is my favourite. Click on stop there and save the page. Now what you'll, you'll notice here that I've also got a small little record button. And if I click on that, you will be able to hear the voice read back to you. Just do I remember it. walking down Carden Street on the way to school and stopping to buy sweets with my pocket money. Oh, I'm going to stop that because my your voice never sounds the same out loud as it does in your head. So I'm only going to do a quick recording of that. OK, so again, moving through my book, what I want to do now is I want to add some music. So don't judge me for my taste in music. So I'm going to put in here that Music from the, oh, can't spell, apologies. Music from the 80s. Reminds me of a school disco. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to search on YouTube for some hits of the 80s. So I click on here. In true Blue Peter fashion, I've got one I prepared earlier. So once you've found the link um, or for the music or the video that you want, you can highlight, copy, jump back to your story, click on the green button again and paste that in here. Again, you get the preview so you know you've copied the right link and you can add that to your page and save. And again, now if I click on this, it will start playing the music out loud. I'm going to stop that. <laughs> okay. Yes, I know, Chris, thank you. <laughs> okay, so hopefully what you've seen now is you've seen that you can register, um, you can create a book, you can upload different types of media, you can start populating the About Me section. If you want to log out, because we know that, you know, you're going to want to build your book over time, if you click on the account button here, you can just log out. And you'll notice here that now I've started to add some pictures. You can see that they've got my little picture of my book there. Log out. So in the first demo, I showed you how to create and upload rich media and look at using Life Stories book, um, uh, you know, creating a Life Stories book. What I want to do in this example is to show you how a Life Stories book that has been more greatly populated, so it's got more images and more pages populated, can be used as a way of engaging and communicating. Whether you are communicating with families, carers, clinicians, volunteers, we know that communication is key. We also know that the inability to effectively communicate can lead to distressed behaviour. So having an easily accessible book 
will help prompt conversation, including family intergenerational um, engagement. So let me zoom back over. And this time I'm going to log in with a different account. And here's the book, the second book that I want to share with you. So this book here, again, it's me, but with some different images in um, and has got some more pages on. So let's say we were, you know, I was working or looking through this book with a family member. We can flick through. Well, notice here that I've started to put some additional information in ab about me. And down here, I've got down here that crafts are one of my favourite hobbies. I know I used to cook, I don't do so much now, but I'm still really interested in crafting. So as we flick through, we can see some, some pictures, some more music, some of the achievements, some younger, much younger photos and pictures of my family. Okay, so here's the hobbies page. So again, I would, you know, I can, I can use this as a way of talking about things that I've done in the past, some of the things that give me a lot of pleasure to do. And maybe this would prompt a conversation about, right, that, there are things that we have done. Why don't we look at maybe starting to work on a new project together? So less about the past and more about things that we're going to do together. So I'm going to create a new page. So I just click here, add page. And this page is going to be about our next project. So our next project could be about maybe creating, oops, creating a blanket for the winter because I don't crochet very fast so I need to start now and maybe here what we want to do also is maybe add a pattern or maybe a, a demonstration video of some, some to give us some ideas and some inspiration about what that blanket may look like so again much like we did before I can click here I can find a clip or a video and a pattern and I can copy that and I can paste that in. And here we go. I've got some instructional videos on how to create a granny square, which is what my blanket's going to be made up for. And then we can save this. And then maybe when we finish making the blanket, we can upload some additional images of what the finished result looked like. One of the other things that I wanted to do in here is once you've got more of a complete book, you can also export the book. So in the, on the, the little share button here, when you move down, you'll see it says exporting your book. You can export your book um, as a PDF, which means that you can then download it or you can print it or you can export it to a video so that it becomes a slideshow and then you can play that. You get the option to choose what you want to export. So for now, I'm just going to export the, the This Is Me page. I could do the others, but it, it can be you know, the more pages you've got in your book, the slower that that can take. So I'm just going to do one chapter and click on export to PDF. And here we go. So, you know, it's me because it's got my picture in there. And then as I scroll down, you start to see the populated This Is Me information, which, as I said before, you can click here to download or you can print. And I'm just going to log it. Okay, so hopefully that example has has shown you how you can use an existing book as not only a tool to look and engage and stimulate conversation, but maybe about planning additional projects that you want to do uh, moving forward. So the final demo. So up to date, we've shown the power of the application in a kind of one to one setting, but I wanted to finish by showing the application in a group setting. So creating a book around a shared interest or, you know, family members all getting together and creating a book collaboratively. So for this example, you need to imagine that um, I've got an interest in football and you need to imagine that I've got a football, uh, an interest in football around Worcester. So I'm working with with a group of friends um, and that's that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to show you how to 
create a book, start working on the book, invite other friends and relatives to help me on the book and show how we can all work on that together. So I'm already still logged in from before and you'll notice on my dashboard page that here I've got the option to start a new book. So that's what I'm going to do. So I click on start book. Okay, I think I'll be in that be easier. Okay, the first thing I want to do is to edit this book. And this book, as we said before, is going to be about our football memories. Save and continue. Okay. Now, we, we mentioned before that we've got these pre-populated cha uh, chapters, but we know that for this book, these chapters are not really what we want. So we click on them. Save it first, apologies. Save it. Click on these. Okay. So it's not going to be about our, my childhood. What we want to do here is I'm going to talk about the, the glory years of 1965 to 1966. And there's something that as a group, when we were talking about football, we remember. So 64 to 65. And save that. When we when we were talking earlier, remember we talked about um, uh, life packs. So here are the the life packs. There are two life packs in here at the moment, but the team at Herefordshire and Worcester are adding loads of additional life packs. So the life pack that I'm going to look at today is the Worcester City Football one. So if I click on that link, you'll see here that I can look through the history of the football club and there's a really lovely PDF in here. I can look in and I can read and I can review the photos and the words and I can also download this and print. What's great about the, the life packs is you don't need to be signed in or registered uh, within the application to use the life packs. The life packs can be used outside of the application. Okay. So when I'm reading all this information, I've remembered that there's a player that was really awesome and his name was Norman Dealey. So what I'm going to do now is to see in here if I can find a picture of him. I'm going to scroll down. I see some lovely pictures that have been added to this life pack, copies of old programmes. And indeed, here you go, 1964 to 65. And here's our Norman Dealey. So if I wanted to use this image in my life pack, if I right click and copy the image address, go back to my life story, edit it, click on here, I can now paste that and there's my image and I can add that to the page. So as you can see, I'm now starting to build out some of the things that, that maybe I remember about football, but what I want to do on this particular book is to collaborate with some other people. So if I click on the share button, You'll see here that I have the ability to share with somebody else. I can share to somebody else with different types of permissions. You can share to somebody who's just a reader um, and as the name suggests, they can just read the book or an editor and they can add to the book so they can create pages and they can add media to or a manager. The manager can do exactly the same as the editor but they have the additional privileges of being able to share with somebody else or in fact delete the book. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share it with another account, the one that created in the first example. And I'm going to share as an editor. OK. And now I'm going to log out of this account. If I log in as that other person who will also receive an email to say, hey, you've been invited to to join a book. So here's the book that we that we created in the first example. And down here where it says books shared with me, 
here's the book that we've just shared. And if I click on this, here's the football memories. Here's the picture we uploaded. And I can now add a page as well. So I may also want to say, hey, 1964 to 65 was great. Well, what about 19, 1966 when we won the World Cup? Maybe we start talking about 1966 and the World Cup. Apologies for my spelling. World Cup. Click on here. And here again, I found a nice little clip of the World Cup. And I can copy this clip. Pop it in my book. And add that to my page. And save this. Now, when I log out of this, if I logged in again, which I won't, but when I log in again with the other ID, this picture will now be in here. So now again, not only are we using our, uh, collaborating and doing our own memories, but maybe we can use this for saying, hey, you know, that, let's, let's try and book when we can now go and visit Worcester for real, when we can start playing football, when COVID restrictions are, are, are lessened and we can make plans to go and see as a group um you know the the football once everything's open i'm gonna log out of this one and tab and tab back okay so hopefully i've shown you three different examples where um, life stories work can be undertaken um, two as an individual uh, one to create one to collaborate um, and, and also to um, engage and communicate. So, um, first of all, I want to thank you all for your time. I've really enjoyed showing you the platform. Um, I really wanted to reiterate what Chris said earlier, that Verse One has got innovation at its core, and it's been a really exciting project for us to work on. We're continuing to work with Natasha and the team at Worcester to build on this initial release, um, and we would really love to make this application something that's used UK-wide. Now I'm going to hand back to Natasha. Thanks, Sue. You're making me smile because obviously I'm the same as you. I, the, the, Natasha is more when I'm in trouble, all that more formal. <laughs> I, I guess I do use that a lot when I'm, when I'm at work. Um, thank you again. Obviously, it's it's now the the second time that I've I've seen it. First time I was speechless. I I did say that. Um, I think it just. It's just incredible, isn't it? From from that first workshop through to what we can see, and um, so to me, the difference it's going to make to people. And when you say about it expanding, so I just um, I wanted to say thank you, and I, and I loved how you ended on the football memories because I think one of the workshops I remember. Uh, Lynn and everyone getting excited that actually for me, for, for, for sharing, um, was thinking about um, families and actually the amount of people that really do want to do it as a community with that, that idea of coming together and that whole other layer that you could have this book that you could share. So, um, yeah, I hope just saying it's incredible is enough, really. Um, so thank you, uh, Chris and Sue. We have Joe. Joe, thank you so much for, for being able to come um, and to, to say a few words before we move to the um, questions, if that's okay, everyone. So I'll now um, I'll now hand over to, to Joe. I did have a photo up of you, Joe, earlier. Just <laughs> <in terms> of... <laughs> Apologies for the gremlins, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm sorry I couldn't join you at the beginning. And, and actually coming in then and hearing the tail end of that, it sounded absolutely fascinating. And particularly the bit about uh, football, um, and thanks to Julian, yes, for, for bringing that in. My husband, Dave, would be absolutely um, amazed at being able to access those photos and those pieces of fact about the football club because he's a, a, a real football fan. Uh, so apologies that I couldn't join you at the beginning. And um, it's lovely to be here now. Uh, and uh, just to say from a personal point of view, um, I just love looking through old photos, um, old facts about Worcester. 
and um, it, it gives me a sense of comfort and a sense of belonging uh, because I've lived in Worcester all my life and uh, so Worcester to me is home and uh, I feel I feel very happy and very content uh, when I'm in Worcester and uh, looking back through old Worcester gives me lovely memories of when I was a child and I had a very happy childhood here uh, so I think that um, th that it is a lovely resource to be able to look at our old photos and data uh, and maps uh, about what Worcester was like. Um, there's the Know Your Place platform and the Life Stories platform, and I'm sure that these will both be well used uh, by people um, to research their own particular history and their own particular area, and also to produce those books that uh, I've just caught the end of, which uh, I think will be a, of a huge asset and a huge pleasure to people in being able to do that. Um, as I said, I've lived in Worcester all my life and I've got very vivid memories of the city uh, from when I was a child. Uh, Dave, my husband, is also a Worcester lad and we both love looking at old photos of places that we knew uh, as children. And uh, these will be a great tool. These two platforms will be a great tool to us to be able to do that. Um, Sometimes it's easier to recall memories from long, a long time ago uh, as you get older than it is from more recent events. And, um, you know, from that point of view, I think uh, it, it would be a great help to us there. We're always saying, do you remember so-and-so? Or uh, do you remember what that street used to look like? Uh, and, oh, yes, I remember that shop. We're always recollecting the past. Uh, when I was a child, um, I went to St Peter's Primary School and uh, that building is now the Museum of Royal Worcester. And I've been lucky enough to be able to go into the museum and I always... Uh, remember, I'm always back in my school when I enter the building, even though it's changed a lot inside. I can remember where the hall was, going up the stairs where our classrooms were. So it brings back those happy memories. Um, my local church was St Peter the Great, uh, where I was married and my children were christened. And because it was a church school that I attended, we regularly went to the church. Sadly, that church has been demolished but my memories of it and other places are very vivid and sharp and I enjoy remembering events with other family members and old school friends who lived nearby. I then went on to the girls' grammar school, which was at that time the building opposite St George's Square and is now a residential retirement village and I have been into that building uh, too and I can immediately remember what it was like as my school and the events that happened there. So although I've travelled extensively, I've been to lots of places in the world, it's always lovely to come back to Worcester and to feel that this is home. Uh, and I enjoy, and I'm sure other people do, looking back on Worcester's past. I'm sure that both of these platforms will be well used and a valuable resource for local people, young and old to find out more about their city. So I'm very, very pleased to be here today uh, helping to launch these platforms and I'm sure they'll be well used. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Jo. And, and it really resonated for me actually when you said, that just to hear your stories, because that's what I mentioned earlier in terms of, um, you know, having that opportunity and when we met, but then, how you connected them both with potentially for some people as they age, that ability to recall more recent events becomes harder. And then having, having a platform where you can capture that um, in a place and then be able to come back to it. So I just, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Gina, did you want to say thank anything you. before? 
Yeah, just just to to re to um, reiterate that, really, Joe. Thank you so much for joining us today. And yeah, it's really really great to hear your story and sort of um, you know set that in in that context, really. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I realised, and I just wanted to say to to Chris and Sue, you said about continuing working with us. And but as a, as opposed to just saying it's incredible, I'm looking forward to that too. Can I just say so? Just just add that that on um uh, thank you everyone we're now at the point of uh we, we really hope you've enjoyed seeing both demonstrations and and us talking through about the importance of both the platforms has anybody got any questions that they'd like to ask um also oh yes um sorry neil yeah hi um yeah i'm neil i'm a, a local filmmaker in worcester so the idea of kind of stories and um, archives and stuff is kind of interesting to me as well as I guess part of what I do. What I was thinking about was what are the opportunities to use the Know Your Place archive, say in my own film projects, can you license the pictures are they, or, or, or how does that work? Yeah, certainly Neil. I mean, in terms of um, the collections that we're making available um, from the Worcester City Historic Environment Record, uh, mm -hmm. the are all free freely available to to use um so yeah uh, if you want to have a conversation with us about that then um yeah get in touch okay cool and the other thing was I, I just wanted to say i'd be really happy to donate some time if there were any specific stories you wanted a film to be put onto the any of the platforms um i'd be happy to donate some filming and maybe editing time as i'm really interested in getting involved in stories in whisper that would be wonderful Definitely need to get to get in touch with you in that case. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. That'd be brilliant. I'll put my email address in the chat. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just to, to sort of um yeah, sort of follow follow that, Neil. Yeah, we um we we are sort of looking at um uh, running some oral history and sort of memory um sharing events um, you know, as going forward. Um mm -hmm. So, so some of that, so, so the filming certainly would be really helpful for that and sort of making those available um, and, and linking those from, from the Know Your Place platform and so on. So, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Um, Catherine, if there have been any um, questions from Facebook as well, please let us know in case there are any that people, I know that there are more people on our Facebook stream at the moment. So. Just to say, if you would like to, to comment on there, please do. Um, we have got someone looking at that and, and we can respond to it. Um, oh, she's responded. So yeah. there's none at the moment. Has anybody got any? I have some questions. Can you hear me? I can, Keith. Yep. Yes. All right. OK. Um, when you start putting information on these, are they available to everybody who goes on or only available to certain people? Which platform are you asking about, Keith, just so we can? Well, for both of them, really. well, for the um, for the life stories one, I think. Okay, if I answer for the life stories platform, yes, it's freely available to all residents of Herefordshire and Worcestershire. Yeah, but can you go on and see what yeah. anybody has put on on their own books? Oh, Chris no. is just about to answer you on that. No, you 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 can't because we we deliberately thought well, actually the. the which parts of your story you want to share should be in your control. So it's it's up to you which bits you want to share. So no, at the moment, those aren't freely available. That's um, cause re yeah, because the reason I asked that, in case you get any trolls on who go around trying to make trouble for vulnerable people. Absolutely. And that was part of that consideration. You know, we, we, we really thought about um, the, the importance of people being able to protect their own data, of not being exposed to, as you say, trolls or other abusers or you know, things leaking out to, to, to things you might not you know. It's a bit like, um, as Polly was saying in her presentation about, you know, you've got your top drawer, your middle drawer, and your bottom drawer. You okay. should be able to control who can see what bits of your. your so story. there is a safeguard for it then? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And another point I would think is of interest is um, downloading photos and images off the internet or from other sources. I know if you take a photo from the 35,000 of Worcester Life Stories, shitty, you would have a problem. But, <laughs> but there are people you might want to load a photo which you've taken as a copy from one of the books or you take off the internet. Now there are certain, it does pay 
just to say where you so what the source of your photo is just yeah uh, otherwise so you I... could run into copyright problems now and one site to avoid downloading photos from is the francis frith they are some right sods by all account now <laughs> they, they really tightened up on things yeah and if you download it for your own use and keep it that way it doesn't matter but if you try to share it now they've got teams of people who are scaring the internet looking for this haven't they it's, it's it's very it's very true, and that's partly why again when when you know when you're putting in videos or or music, we're actually linking to the original source because that gets around some of the copyright issues that we might encounter. Because yeah. you know if you put a a video of you know George Michael's careless whisper into your book, then you know the publisher at least is still getting paid for it, so they're happy about that. Yeah, but well, you're quite right that yeah. you know, the acknowledgement is a good thing to do. That's another uh, thing also, with the music and any videos you might download as well. So that that's why we're we're, we're linking to those like through through and essentially allowing YouTube to do lots of that that. Um, that so yeah. that so do you think you should put a warning on the site or just an advice perhaps that you should yeah, be doing this? There's terms and conditions which you know we're trying to make as 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 simple and yeah. plain English as possible. Yeah. Say you, but, you you shouldn't do these things. Um, but it's it's part of the problem with any user uh, uh, user you know, uploadable content, isn't it? It's any platforms. You know, you shouldn't do these things. And you know, as you say, things like there are some archives or um, organisations that are particularly litigious. But you know, again, part of it is that you know that we're we're using those uh, those platforms to deal with copyright where we can do, and saying to people, well, you know, obviously copyright applies, but you know, for personal use, most of the time. You're probably okay, you know. Well, I mentioned Francis Biff in particular because they've got loads of photos of Worcester on their site, and I've downloaded them in the past. But they do come with um, a watermark on them now. Yeah, yeah. Just, just. I, I just on think that. people should be made aware. Don't download photos from Francis Britt. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. I think yeah, just talk. Yeah, just coming on that from the the know your place point of view, Keith. Um, so there there are sort of guidance uh, notes on on the site in terms of of copyright. But the other thing is with with know your place is that if you're adding material to that as a member of the public, um, there's a validation uh, level. So so that will come to me if you if you've added a, a an image on there, for instance. Uh, there is in the form there is a, a little um, sort of thing to say you know whether the copyright is yours. So if it's a photograph that you've taken yourself, then the, the, the copyright is yours. So that you know yeah, that takes yeah, care of I that. Know. But yeah. Um, but yeah, th there is a validation level. So so if it comes through and it's got a Francis Frith watermark all the way through it, I, I'll just take that down. But you know, so it won't go live onto the site. Uh, with there are there are sort of levels in place to sort of handle that. Are both these platforms live now to, to join and get started on? Yes. Okay, so I'll probably do that tomorrow then. Brilliant. On the way around yeah, we'd love to see your contributions, Keith. <laughs> well, I'll just go in and dabble with it and find my way around, get it wrong and then get it right, I suppose. That's what happens, isn't it? <laughs> Any problems, just get in touch. Okay, all right. You can point in the right direction. <laughs> of course, you, she, you, won't, you won't be able to see Keith's uh, contributions to the Live Stories platform unless he shares it with you. <laughs> well, I've been making a contribution on the um, these 35,000 photos of the <laughs> <And that's>, uh... <laughs> Keith, thank you, because there's never a better endorsement than something. Yeah, but the amount of detail we go into is, um, is that the right kind of bricks they've been using to, to block up that doorway? <laughs> um, oh, just... Okay, then, right, thanks. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Um, there has been, oh, Chris, you've responded. Sorry, thank you, because I, I don't know if you heard. I just said there's never a bigger endorsement than somebody just saying uh, on a launch event, I'm going to go use that. <laughs> I'm going to get off here and use it. So thank you. I think we couldn't have asked for anything um, better, really. Um, Chris, you've answered within the chat. Sue, can I just say a massive thank you to you? You were one of our testers in terms of for the Life Stories platform. Um, and have been instrumental in terms of the things that you've said back. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Your, so your question was just um, from that testing, are there any size restrictions or file format restrictions? Chris, I know you've answered um, in the chat, but could you just answer verbally as you'll, you'll be able to answer better than me? You or Sue, sorry. Sure. Sorry, Sue. 
Um, the, I mean, Sue was saying she had a particular issue with some JPEGs. There shouldn't be a restriction, but there's there's a link in the platform to sort of give us feedback. Um, unless sometimes JPEGs get a bit corrupted, but there shouldn't be restrictions from the image point of view. Um, we, I think that we have a restriction of something like 100 meg to try and you know, which would be a very, very large video um, upload from your machine. But of course, you're linking your video from other places like YouTube and that kind of thing. There won't be a restriction. So, um, and again, we'll 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 play with those. You know, as we see you know, traffic coming through the platform, we can kind of work out which kind of limits are best and how to work out the. But it should be it should take all all sort of you know, standard um, formats um, for all web formats. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Could I could I just ask as well, Chris? Um, you say the platform has been designed uh, specifically for tablets. Um, I've got the laptop. Is there anything else I need to know? Because I have a laptop. No, no, no. I, so, I, I said so the, the platform should work on all devices. It's just that we took the tablet as being our sort of our primary design device. Um, and so that's that's but it should work without any restrictions on the laptop or anything else. Oh lovely. Thank you. Okay. And I think you said there, Chris, didn't you, that there's there'll be a feedback on the form if anyone does yes. have any feedback, you, you can do that. But um I I know from experience, Sue, that they have tested all devices and all <laughs> browsers. Um and the only one where it's less optimal is Internet Explorer eleven. Um and that's also on the platform. And that's just I think does does Internet Explorer fade soon? Uh, that... Well, it's the, it is theoretically end of life, yes. But some people have older computers, so it's uh, the um, Edge is is Microsoft's current one, um, and it uses mostly it's mostly just like Chrome actually. But um, so because you know, one of the things we were testing on quite heavily was Safari for which is on Mac OS and, and of course on tablets and and, and well uh, iPads and iPhones, which of course you know. Um, so that's a big one. Thank you, Chris. Has anybody um, got any other questions for either of the platforms? I was just going to say um, the demos. The demos that I did today I, I was was all from um, was not from a tablet. It was from a PC, and I used I used Chrome and I used Safari when I was tabbing. So you know it does work on all of the different all yeah. of the different platforms. Yeah, I've been really impressed actually with. <laughs> I didn't realise how much you have to do in order to ensure it has to work across all, all browsers. Again, what, what you learn um, when you're involved in a project and don't fully understand that. So, um, I just want to I, I, sorry, Sheila. I, that's okay. Now, I should, I should say as well that um, though your place has been optimised for various um, uh, interfaces as well, hasn't it, Pete? Um, and one of the nice uses for it actually is if you you're using it on your mobile phone you can actually click on the uh the you know if you're out and about in the city and and looking at a particular street you can click on the button to center it to the place that you're standing so that you can then see the mapping and the photos that you've got for that particular place so that's a really nice feature if you're you're actually trying to explore a place on the ground as it were that's nice well done both um is there Oh, sorry. Is that is that a question? I, I always say it's terrible, isn't it? That was to Rob. If you, if you move your hand, you start taking. Well, that wasn't a question from you. No, I don't think so. Has anybody else got any questions? Yes, Di. Yes, I have. Hi. Um, can I ask Sheena? Um, Sheena, you referred to archive material, the changing face of Worcester slides and so on that are being worked on. Um, I presume you're aware that in the late 1990s, the Worcester Record Office did some interviewing and did some audio memories with um, members of the public. Were, were you aware of that? Yeah, so uh, yeah, certainly aware of the the, um, the archive that the um, the Record Office have there. Um, we are we are having some discussions around what we can make available uh, via the platform. There are there are various hoops to, to jump through in terms of things like um, you know GDPR and all those sorts of things as well. 
So, um, but yeah, we're certainly having those conversations. And um, yeah, the, the first batch of material um, we, that we hope will go up will be the uh, the oral histories that uh, Clive Haynes has provided. And uh, some of those are really fascinating, actually. That some of them are from the late sixties and early seventies. So some of the people that are talking, you know, have got uh, memories from the you know the late nineteenth century and early twentieth century. So some really great material in there. Looking forward to getting that up on the. That's good. Um, yeah, it's just that my mother was someone who was interviewed oh, in, in 1999 and yeah. she was asked, uh, the, the interviews took two forms. The first set of questions were concerning what it was like to grow up in as a child in Worcester, bearing in mind she was born in 1912. Um, and the second um, uh, set of questions was about what was it like to live in Worcester during the Second World War. So and I've got I've got it on CD. I've, I've got the CD of my mom, my mom's interview, but that will be in the record office and I, I'm assuming others will be too. So it, yeah. I guess it could be quite difficult getting. I mean, there would be no problems. My mother's passed away, obviously now, but um, I would imagine a number of most people would have probably passed on who were in. Yes. Yeah, there, it's it's certainly a conversation that that we're we're having, and yeah, and, and like you said, it'd be lovely to lovely to be able to make those available more widely available, and and, and the you know the beauty of having um, know your place is that you know it's been very difficult to get things like oral history uh, recordings out out to the the general public in the past, and and hopefully this kind of gives us a mechanism for doing that. Um, so, yeah, I hope that over time we'll, we'll be able to capture more and more um, sort of uh, oral uh, recordings in that way. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, what an amazing thing to share. I've just had, you know, and just in terms of the, um, what that would mean, it, you know, that's just the, for your mum. So just thank you for sharing that and obviously for Sheila for being able to sort it. Hopefully, put that caveat in. Um, has anybody got any other questions that they, they want to ask of either platform? Oh, light's gone off. It's, I don't know if that's a sign. Um, yesterday around this time, we actually got um, Polly saying about it being a, a sunny afternoon, which I believe it's even more glorious out there today, isn't it? In terms of for a, um, whether it be tea, wine, water, beer, beer or gin. <laughs> um, the um, Shuna, did you just want to say a last few words about know your place before I say about Life Stories platform when we sign off? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, just to say that um, obviously what you've seen today, as Pete has um, demonstrated, is only the beginning of that journey. Really, we've we've kind of you know we've had this big push to get to this point where we can launch the platform. Um, but uh, obviously, going forward, we're really um, looking to 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 you, to the public, to um, to all of our um, partners in in various organisations to um, to help us sort of make that content grow over time. And and it really will be that space to capture um, local expertise and knowledge, really, and memory. So thank you everyone for for everything that you've done to support us in getting this far. It's um, it's really exciting to to be able to take it forward. Uh, I think that's a lovely thing to to say, Sheen, because I guess that's that's what I'd say in terms of um, for the Life Stories platform and the whole project. We know that we wouldn't be here without the same level of passion and commitment that that people have done. Um, from the volunteers or, you know, like Sue, um, all the way through. And I think I do have those moments where when you see something come to life that you know will make a difference. So Sue, your demonstrations, when when I, I think about the people that I've worked with or when Polly shared her stories, I know already the, the difference the platform is going to make. And I know as we continue to, to work together, you know, little heart won't. Um, how much more it's going to continue in terms of some of the conversations we've had. So I just want to echo Sheila really in terms of saying thank you to everybody. Um, Keith, thank you so much for your endorsement. 
we, we obviously won't get to see what people put on the live stories platform and, and absolutely shouldn't. But just the thought that people are going to be doing it um, and that it will impact their lives is, is just heartwarming. So thank you, everybody. And take care. Enjoy the sunshine. Thanks, everyone. Bye.